Mayday! Mayday! Engine Stop. flame out! Stop! A dash cam video captures the last moments of a horrific plane crash. A minor flight issue. Right engine oil pressure. Turns into a crisis. Get it! Get it! There was several places where the airplane could have been saved. Fire. A revolutionary new aircraft breaks up during a critical flight. Three tragedies caused by fateful decisions made in the heat of the moment. The tendency is always, let's solve the problem right this minute, and we've lost a lot of airplanes that way. Taipei, capital city of Taiwan. Near its center lies Songshen Airport. The next plane scheduled for departure this morning is TransAsia Flight 235. The first officer is Leo Tsi Chuang. He has almost 7,000 hours of flying time. Oil pressure? Check. The captain, Leo Chiunsung, is a former military pilot. A third pilot is observing today's flight. TransAsia 235 is a one-hour commuter flight from Taipei to the Taiwanese island of Kinmen, just off the coast of mainland China. TransAsia 235, runway 10, wind 100 degree, nine or not, cleared for takeoff. Okay, cleared for takeoff. Immediately after takeoff, the captain engages the autopilot. Gear up. Gear up. Flight 235 climbs over metropolitan Taipei, home to more than 7 million people. Seconds later, the master warning sounds. The master warning is indicative of an emergency situation requiring an immediate response. TransAsia 235 has lost an engine. The captain disengages the autopilot. I have control. You have control. Heading mode. He needs a heading back to the airport. We're below 2,500 feet. Turn to heading. It's... Come on. Zero. Zero nine or five. Check. When you lose an engine in a twin-engine aircraft, you need to be able to maintain your climb performance. Okay, engine flame out, check, check. The speed and climb rate are dropping fast. Watch the speed. Stop, stop, stop. The stall warning indicates the plane is flying too slowly to maintain lift. Stop. The stall warning at low altitudes is uh, a critical situation that no pilot ever wants to end up in. Terrain ahead. Tower, Transasia, two, three, five. Mayday, mayday. Engine flame out. Engine flame out, both sides. How is this possible? The crew was surrounded by high-density housing, high-rise apartment blocks, a heavily populated area. Impact! Where is the impact? Oh no! Oh. Oh. Marine! Marine! Oh. 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 TransAsia Flight 235 has gone down in the Keelung River. Suspend all takeoff and landing operations. Begin emergency procedures. Rescuers rush to the scene. Of the 58 people on board, only 15 make it out alive. 
All three pilots are dead. Investigators from Taiwan's Aviation Safety Council need to start collecting evidence at the scene. But even before they leave headquarters... Take a look at this. A stunning piece of evidence from a dashboard camera surfaces. What? What was happening on that plane? What do you think? Left engine? When you watch the video clip, we know there's something wrong about the engine. The prop seems very slow. Is this the left engine? Uh, yes. Investigators can see in the dash cam video that the plane was banked steeply to the left. A faulty left engine is the most likely suspect. But the recovered engine shows no sign of a fault. Left engine completely operational. Ah, strange. When they study the right engine, what they find is equally mystifying. Look at the blades. They're feathered. Feathered is a propeller's fail-safe position. When a propeller engine loses power in flight, the blades automatically rotate parallel to the airstream to reduce drag and allow the plane to operate with one engine. Why would the right engine be feathered when the dash cam video clearly shows the plane banking to the left? It doesn't make any sense. Let's have a look. When we discover a feather of the propeller, we know there should be something wrong about the engine. But their inspection shows the right engine is also in working condition. If both engines were operational, well, why did this plane crash? Investigators hope the plane's flight data recorder, which records dozens of flight parameters, can tell them more. But all data points indicate the plane was operating normally except for one. Take a look at this. The torque is all over the place. Torque is the twisting rotational force created by the engine. It increases and decreases during specific phases of flight, but it's not supposed to fluctuate in such rapid bursts. Why is it doing that? They dig deeper, studying how the Pratt & Whitney engine measures torque. So we try to find out the design logic for the system. What's the connection between the torque and the feathered propellers? They learned that the engine's auto feathering system includes an electronic torque sensor. It measures how much rotational force the engine is producing. An extremely low torque reading indicates that the engine has failed and triggers automatic feathering. But investigators have already concluded the engine was operational. They need to find the reason incorrect torque readings would cause the right engine to feather. Maybe the sensor is sending a faulty reading, triggering the auto feathering unit. Investigators find the circuit board from the right engine and look for any defects that could have caused the propeller to feather in flight. <sighs> it's a broken solder they discover microscopic faults in the circuit board. With a broken circuit board, the sensor couldn't detect torque, even though the engine was functioning perfectly. So the system automatically feathered the propeller. OK, engine flame out check. Check. They now understand why the right side propeller feathered. Investigators now face an even bigger mystery. Losing thrust in the right engine should cause a right bank. But the dash cam video clearly shows the plane banking left. The power lever angle. When investigators check the throttle settings on the left or number one engine, they make a stunning discovery. 
Unbelievable. The power of the number one engine was gradually being reduced, reduced, and eventually be shut off. On this ATR-72, the throttles can only be moved by hand. It had to have been shut down by one of the pilots. So we start to wondering why the pilot was shut down the good engine. That's crazy. How is this possible? Three. Investigators turn to the cockpit voice recording to help explain why TransAsia Flight 235 crashed in Taipei's Keelung River. TransAsia 235, contact approach, a 119er decimal 7. Good day. We still have number one engine produce power normally, but for some reason, the pilot decided to shut down the good engine. We had to find out why. What's that sound? It must be the engine to fault warning. Investigators already know a faulty torque sensor caused the right engine to feather and lose thrust. This is a crucial moment. Let's hear what they're going to do next. I have control. Investigators hear the sound of the autopilot turning off. He's disengaging the autopilot. He shouldn't be doing that. He just made a difficult situation worse. OK. Engine flame out, check. Check. There is a checklist procedure on the screen. If they follow the procedure, do everything correctly, they should be able to fly back to land without any problem. But instead of following the emergency checklist, watch the speed. The captain does something inexplicable. Pull back number one. Both engines are capable of producing power. But because the right engine has feathered, it has lost thrust, behaving like a car in neutral gear. When the captain then pulls back the left engine throttle, he leaves himself with no thrust at all. How could he do such a thing? The captain of Flight 235 has shut down the plane's only working engine. No, wait a second. Cross check. The pilot monitoring to his credit, did try to stop the pilot flying from manipulating the engine number one power lever, and he announced he wanted to cross-check. Heading mode. But the captain interrupted the first officer to ask for a new heading. Come on. Zero. Zero, nine, or five. All of a sudden, they've got a dual engine failure, and the pilot monitoring, I think, has been caught off guard, and he's not really sure what's gone on. Restart the engine. I can't restart the engine. When the captain realizes his mistake... Oh, well. I, I shut off the wrong engine. There's no time to restart the engine. Impact! Oh, no! Investigators now have an even more puzzling question to answer. Why didn't the captain understand what he was doing? Did taking manual control of the plane distract the pilot from verifying which engine failed? Watch the speed. He could have been suffering from change blindness. Change blindness, people are focused or fixated on, on another item or area of interest, and so they miss what would be considered a very distinguishable change in the environment, but they don't perceive it. I will pull back engine one throttle. Even when all the systems were telling him it was engine two, his perception told him he was doing the right thing. <sighs> Change blindness. Investigators finally understand what went wrong aboard TransAsia Flight 235. A microscopic crack in a circuit board disabled a sensor in the right engine, causing the system to incorrectly determine that the engine had failed. This was a series of mistakes on the part of the captain. When engine two feathered, the captain reacted before he had properly assessed the situation. Mm. 
The captain should have followed a checklist. I have control. But in the heat of the moment, he turned off the autopilot and reduced power in the wrong engine. I will pull back engine one throttle. He shut down their only working engine. By the time he realizes, it's too late. Restart the engine. I can't restart the engine. Well, I shut off the wrong engine. The crash of Flight 235 would be the last accident for TransAsia Airways. In November 2016, the company went out of business. When you talk about the TransAsia situation in Taipei, we've got a situation there where if they had just delayed until they had enough altitude and airspeed doing anything, they would have probably lived. Runway in sight. But sometimes, when a split-second decision is made... Steer! Steer! ...even a minor issue can turn deadly. Derek! It's Easter Monday, 1994, at Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport. Set torque. My controls. KLM City Hopper Flight 433 is preparing to fly from Amsterdam to Cardiff, Wales. Torque set. Flying time is an hour and 20 minutes. V1, rotate. The plane is a Saab 340B, a dual turboprop designed for short regional flights. The captain on flight 433 is 37-year-old Gerrit Levard. The first officer, Paul Stassen, is 34. There are 21 passengers on board. Amsterdam KLM 433. Go ahead, 433. Is flight level 200 available? Climb to 200, you are re-cleared, flight level 200. Thank you, sir. Climbing, flight level 200, KLM 433. But on the way up to 20,000 feet... Right engine oil pressure. Check. Take action. Copy. Taking action. First Officer Stassen consults the engine oil pressure warning checklist. There are several reasons where oil pressure could drop in an engine, primarily due to leaks or some sort of damaging event in the engine system. Emergency checklist for engine and propeller oil pressure low. The checklist tells him to monitor the warning light and the oil pressure gauges. If the warning light is on or the gauge is below 30, then you can continue. But if you have both, then shut down the engine. That's not the case. The crew decides it's safe to keep flying. But then... OK, uh, we're not climbing anymore. Approaching 17,000 feet, Captain Levart notices the plane is not climbing as quickly as it should be. No. We need to return to Amsterdam, make a pan call, request to maintain flight level 160, tell them we have a technical issue. A pan call means there is an unusual situation. Please pay attention to us. We need extra help. Amsterdam KLM 433, pan, 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 pan. We have an engine problem, and we'd like to maintain 160 for return to Schiphol. That's copy, sir. You may turn right, heading to Schiphol. KLM 433, can you give me any details? KLM 433, situation's under control. We have an engine oil pressure problem in engine number two. Yes, okay, we can bring you in for 06. You're number one. Five minutes later, the plane lines up with the runway. Runway in sight. Laps 20. Laps 20. Outer marker. Check. KLM 433 is just 500 feet above the ground. Watch your speed. The plane has slowed to the point that it could stall. Come on it. 
Suddenly, the plane banks to the right. Going around, set torque, flap seven, gear up. Captain Levart attempts a go around, but the plane keeps banking right. Steer, 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 get it, get it, get it! Crash, 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 runway zero six, emergency runway zero six. KLM Flight 433 has crashed in a field next to the runway. Of the 24 people on board, two passengers and the captain are dead. Eight passengers and the first officer are seriously injured. Investigators from the Netherlands Aviation Safety Board recover the plane's black boxes and send them off for processing. Meanwhile, lead investigator Ben Gronendijk is eager to speak with air traffic control. We go to the tower and approach, uh, and we get the first information. They issued a pan call. We're coming back to the airport. Amsterdam KLM 433, pan, 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 pan. We have an engine problem, and we'd like to maintain 160 for return to Schiphol. Did they tell you what the problem was? Yeah, they said it had to do with the oil pressure. KLM 433, situation's under control. We have an engine oil pressure problem in engine number two. Next thing I knew, they were going around. Going around. Set torque, flap seven, gear up. Pilots conduct a go around if their landing becomes unstable. They increase the power, they gain altitude, they circle around, and they try a second time for that landing. Right before the aircraft is about to touch down. Steer, steer! The potential for danger is much, much higher than if the same problem happened at altitude. In a hangar at Schiphol Airport, the investigators try to determine the nature of the oil pressure problem and if it contributed to the crash. You could have a seizure of an engine or uh, overheating because of the, the oil uh, is not there. Well, turbines are moving. But curiously, they find no evidence of any oil pressure issues. Any damages from the impact? Not from oil pressure. It seems the pilots reported a problem that didn't exist. Why would they report a problem if they didn't have one? What were they looking at? Investigators now wonder, did the cockpit instruments on KLM Flight 433 somehow malfunction and mislead the pilots? Right engine oil pressure. Check. Take action. Copy. Taking action. When investigators test the oil pressure system, one thing jumps out. Ah, OK. There's a short circuit in the switch. Now they understand what the pilots were seeing, a false warning. Right engine oil pressure. But a false warning alone is not enough to cause a crash. Investigators turn to the cockpit voice recorder. OK, let's hear it. They hope it will tell them how a false warning, which required no action, still led the pilots to turn back to Schiphol Airport. There's the warning. Right engine oil pressure. Let's see how they handle it. Check, take action. Copy, taking action. The pilots consult an emergency checklist that should help them solve the problem. If the warning light is on or the gauge is below 30, then you can continue. On the Saab 340, the warning system 
and the oral measuring system are two separate systems. And if there is a confusion between the two, the guidance on the emergency checklist is to continue normal operations. So the light is on, but we're above 30 PSI. So continue normal operation. The recording reveals that the pilots knew it was safe to continue their flight. Why the heck did they decide to turn back? OK, uh, we're not climbing anymore. Ah, no. That must be why they turned back. Engines are fine. Why are they not climbing? Investigators now turn to the flight data recorder. What's going on here? Right side engine thrust. It's dropping. It's a major discovery. It suggests pilot error may have caused the deadly disaster. Right here, right after the alarm goes off, he actually pulls the power back all the way to idle. The captain may have been trying not to further damage what he thought was a crippled engine when he powered back. And look, he keeps it in idle for the remainder of the flight. Well, no wonder they couldn't climb. Did having an idle engine cause this accident? Let's see the data from the final approach. The data shows how the right engine being at idle affected the landing. At this point, they're too slow. Watch your speed. I'm on it. The captain advances power to the left engine, pushing the aircraft to the right because the right engine isn't producing thrust. Now, at this point, there's no way they're going to make the landing, so they have no choice but to attempt to go around. Going around, set torque, flap seven, gear up. To climb, the captain pushes the left engine to maximum power, but that only sends the plane into an even steeper right bank. Oh, steer! Steer! Gear it! Gear it! Gear it! What a blunder. Investigators finally understand the sequence of events that brought down KLM City Hopper Flight 433. Right engine oil pressure. Check. Take action. Taking action. In the heat of the moment, the captain reduces right engine power before his first officer has a chance to read the checklist. This fools them both into thinking they have an engine problem when they didn't. The right power lever remained in the position of flight idle, and they didn't discuss the consequences of that. Going around, set torque, flap seven, gear up. Attempting a go around using just one engine is the final mistake. Steer, steer, just steer, gear it, gear it, gear it. The Netherlands Aviation Safety Board determines that the cause of those errors goes beyond the cockpit. The final report recommends KLM review pilot testing techniques, establish cockpit management training, and improve guidance on flying with an idle engine. There's an old adage in aviation about the level of forgiveness of an airplane but one of the things it's not going to forgive is failing to do the things that are in the checklist appropriately checklists are there for a reason it's an adage that holds for even the best pilots in the most advanced planes
At the Mojave Air and Space Port in Southern California, a revolutionary new aircraft is about to undertake a test flight. It's called Spaceship Two. System booting. The spaceship is designed by American aerospace company Scaled Composites for Virgin Galactic. Showing green across the board. Copy that. Virgin Galactic's owner, Sir Richard Branson, hopes this unique craft will soon carry paying customers to the edge of space and back. Together, we can make space accessible in a way that has only been dreamt of before now. The success of this stage of the program rests on the shoulders of these two test pilots. 43-year-old Peter Siebold is an award-winning engineer. He's piloted 11 different types of experimental aircraft. His co-pilot, 39-year-old Mike Alsbury, is also a seasoned test pilot and an aeronautical engineer. They've spent almost nine months training for this mission. These guys are test pilots, uh, very, very experienced pilots. These are the best of the best of the best. Their rocket-powered spaceship is suspended from a jet-powered plane with a 140-foot wingspan. The launch plane is called White Knight 2. White Knight 2 will carry the spaceship up to 46,000 feet. At that altitude, Spaceship 2 will detach from the airplane, fire its rocket motor, and climb another 100,000 feet up into the Earth's atmosphere flying four times higher than a typical commercial aircraft. It will then glide back to Earth. Monitoring today's flight is a flight director. He communicates with a team of flight engineers and the four pilots. At 9.20 a.m. White Knight 2, you are go. Takeoff speed is 150 knots. Once Spaceship 2 is released, Captain Seabold will take the control column while co pilot Alsbury monitors the instruments and configures the craft for its descent. You are clear to arm at pylon release. I'll call fire. In the minutes before launch, the pilots review the flight checklists they've been training for months to memorize. Call pitch up, pitch down, trim, feather, unlock, 1.4. Things happen very, very, very quickly. They do not have the time physically to go and pull out the checklist and read the checklist, because these things are happening second after second after second. Glide trim's good, green for release. OK, here we go. Stick. Stick us forward. And five, four, three, two, one. Release. As Spaceship Two drops from its carry plane, we release. Mike Alsbury engages the experimental rocket motor. Arm. Fire. Fire. 6,000 pounds of thrust propel them towards the speed of sound. Good light. Spaceship 2, its top speed is close to 3 Mach, so uh, three times the speed of sound, over 2,000 miles per hour. Yeah! It's a very, very rough ride. So you think about the worst turbulence you've been in an aircraft liner, and then magnify that by 10. It was supposed to be a 38-second burn of the engine. But just 14 seconds after ignition, something goes terribly wrong. Spaceship Two lies in pieces after breaking up over California's Mojave Desert. Co-pilot Mike Alsbury was killed in the crash. 
Amazingly, Captain Pete Siebold parachuted to safety. He's badly injured, but alive. Emergency responders rush him to the hospital, while a team from the NTSB combs through the wreckage spread over the Mojave Desert. One of the things that we were able to tell by being on scene was that the motor was not an issue as to why the vehicle broke up. Investigators hope the craft's external cameras will provide vital information. See here? The tail boom folded in on the aircraft along the hinge of the feather system. He went into feather mode. Feather mode refers to the defining feature of Spaceship 2's design. The spaceship actually changes shape during flight. After reaching maximum altitude, the pilots rotate twin rudders into the feather position to increase drag and slow their descent. The craft can then drop safely back into Earth's atmosphere before gliding to a runway. Lorenda Ward reviews the video from a cockpit camera. So he unlocked the feather system. Correct. But did he actually deploy it? No, and that's a weird thing. No one touched the handle. There are two steps to feathering the spaceship. First, the pilots unlock the feather system so the tail boom can pivot when commanded. Second, the pilots must pull the feather handle to actually deploy the tail boom. So we have the video of the co-pilot unlocking, but we never see him actually operate the feathers. But we know from external video that the feathers moved. So we knew that we had a performance or a, a dynamic issue. Somehow, the system designed to slow the craft on descent deployed while the crew was accelerating towards the speed of sound. To learn more about the feather system, investigators consult engineers at Scaled Composites, the firm that designed Spaceship Two. So when is he supposed to unlock the feather system? between Mach 1.4 and 1.8. Want to play that? 1.8, unlocking. The co-pilot had actually unlocked the feather system early. Isn't it safer to unlock it at lower speeds? No, ma'am, it can be catastrophic. In the transonic phase, you get a huge amount of upward force on the tail boom, on the tail of the spacecraft. And the feather system was not designed to deal with that sort of load. It's a devastating discovery that points to pilot error. Unlocking. When co-pilot Mike Alsbury unlocked the feather system 16 seconds early, aerodynamic forces were so strong, they pulled the tail into the feathered position and tore the aircraft apart. But why would a highly experienced test pilot like Mike Alsbury, who had already carried out eight previous flights on Spaceship Two, unlock the tail boom at the deadliest possible moment? The team pours over training materials. We need to figure out what they were told about unlocking the feather system early. Records show that co-pilot Alsbury flew 112 simulator runs for this mission. Never once did the co-pilot unlock the feather early. Hold on now. But the records do reveal that on one occasion, he unlocked the feather too late. 12 degrees. Feather unlocked. 14 degrees. Mission abort, mission abort. <sighs> If they didn't unlock by 1.8, they would have had aborted the flight. Aborting a mission is not fatal, but it could be a major setback for the program. 0.8. Investigators wonder, did this error in training months ago lead Alsbury mission abort. Mission abort. to act prematurely? 
Investigators believe a time crunch may be one reason Mike Alsbury decided to unlock the feather system early. If they don't unlock the feather mechanism by Mach 1.8, then the flight is aborted. So obviously that's going to be weighing on the co-pilot's mind. You want to get that out of the way. Then they make another discovery. Can I see that simulator video again? The training simulator did not vibrate or mimic G-forces. The pilots didn't feel the actual sensation of a powered flight. Even if you're a very, very good test pilot, that has to be a little bit unnerving to get all this vibration and G-loads and the speed and everything else. Investigators finally know what happened. He had a lot to do. Made a decision to unlock early, perhaps not realizing the deadly implications. The NTSB faults scaled composites for not ensuring pilots understood the consequences of unlocking the feather system early and for failing to take steps to prevent that from happening. Good job. Even just having a sensor that physically prevents them from unlocking until it passes the appropriate threshold would have prevented this accident. In its final report, the NTSB states the probable cause of the disaster was a failure to protect against the possibility that a single human error could trigger a catastrophe. The common thread in all of these tragedies is that people took action without really examining what action was needed, and they moved too fast. Point eight, unlocking. We do know how to prevent them, and that is by sitting on your hands. In most cases, until you are sure you need to take action, you don't take action, because if you take the wrong action, it can lead you into a major problem or a disaster.